Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. If you're watching on YouTube, you can find out more about what we do at officehours.global. Our first hour is general discussion about media production, and our second hour is usually something we want to spend a little bit more time on. And today, we're going to be talking about how we, lessons from architecture and construction can affect how we look at project management. Uh, when you make a mistake in, in construction and architecture, it's expensive, you know. And so, uh, and sometimes you know, just ask the folks in the Millennium Towers in uh, San Francisco; um, it, it can give, it can be a real mess. So, so, um, so we're going to talk about what, where those skills and those learnings can affect all of us doing production. We've got a great set of panelists, um, Ryan Rademan, uh, Mark Giuliani, Peter Buck, and Craig McFarlane will be here. And they're experts that can also answer project management questions uh, during the first hour. So if you've got um, project management questions about the tools, about process, technique, um, throw those in there for the first hour, and then we'll talk about these lessons in the second hour. And of course, this they're going to be coming back every month, about every four weeks. Um, that And uh, so the next one is going to be October 6th or October 2nd, and then November 6th, and they'll be talking about different key concepts in project management. We also have a project management discussion um, in Discord where you can uh, talk to them about that as well. So uh, it's going to be a great second hour for a great uh, week. It's a very, very dense week. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Let's go ahead and jump into the questions. Bill, what do we have? First one comes from Paul Wallace this morning from Austin, Texas. Paul says, Google is running a major cloud conference in Moscone Center in San Francisco, August 29th through 30. You can buy a conference pass for $1,599 U.S., or you can attend digitally for free, no credit card. Will you go? And he notes he signed up, and it's got a link there. Go ahead, Peter. Can't hear you, Peter. Always an interesting show to see uh, Google put on an event. I'm uh, biased towards Mountain View, a little closer to the development team. Uh, Jeff Dean, um, is the chief scientist of Google, is an absolute must-see. He speaks uh, a little bit in the keynote on the second day, so be sure you earmark that. Um, I found uh, getting access to developers is probably the most important part of being there in person. So uh, please report back on uh, what you learn about uh, some of the AI activities. You go ahead, Paul. Yeah, I signed up at, uh, I've been to some Google events in Austin. They're great, a lot of swag. So I'll miss the swag, but I got a complimentary access digital pass and it's tomorrow and the next day. So I'm looking some interesting, uh, looking sessions and I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I don't know. I, don't, I haven't I haven't been to it for a couple of years, um, but it, it's a pretty busy time. I believe that they do it in Moscone West, which is the most modern version of modern part of Moscone. And um, they I think at one point in time, I think they had as many as uh, 15 sessions going on or 15 or 20 sessions going on at the same time, um, which is a logistical complex, you know, log logistical nightmare for streaming. Um, but it does give you a lot of options um, to actually see a lot of different pieces of content. Uh, I'm not sure how they're handling it in the past. They've, they've definitely had a lot of that content up later that you can watch on YouTube. So um, that's also another, another opportunity there. Next question. Khalid Majaya of Hassa, Saudi Arabia. I just got my brother P Touch Cube XPPT P910BT. How can I stop it from leaving a half inch empty space at the beginning of every print? Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, I've found that same problem. I think it's to make you use more tape. If you print a series of them, uh, you can, you know, of the same label. You can then get it without adding that extra half inch, half inch to the beginning of each label that it cuts off. Uh, but otherwise, I think it it spits out that half inch and cuts it off every time. My solution was to find a uh, place to buy the tape a lot cheaper. It's fifteen bucks for four of them there, so that's really cheap. You can get the knockoffs on Amazon, and I haven't had any problems with the third party brand of the P Touch compatible tapes. They work quite well, and it cuts down your expenses by about one one quarter of what the actual real tapes cost from brother. I go ahead, Paul. Yeah, the default setting is large margin, but you can set it to small margin or no cut or chain. I, I don't know what chain means, but uh, you have some options there. Yeah, you're right. It's a calibration process with the cutting and it makes sure that it's not, if, it, it make sure it doesn't cut on the edge of a word. Um, so it's always putting a little spacer out there. The, lower, the smaller margin will 
reduce it, but that's still inside of the box. Um, so it's still inside the, it's a small margin inside of what it considers the box. And where that's really going to affect it is what you see on the cut end, um, because it's going to leave that front end open and then it's going to cut there. Um, what, what's being talked about here, because usually what happens is the the margin, if we if we look at this here, that margin is is between the text and the, where it's going to cut. And that's going to be somewhat defined um, because it, it pulls that out, cuts off that piece. That way it knows exactly how much is on that on that the first edge of the margin. Then it rolls out and gives that. And so to, to properly center it, it needs to do that. I actually talked to someone about that, that brother. Um, and uh, it makes these little pieces, these little pieces that it uses to make sure that it has. This is what he, this is what uh, Khalid is talking about is these little, these little chunks that get created. I keep these. That's why I have them sitting right here. I keep them and I put them on little things that I just need to mark temporarily or I need to use, and I just use a Sharpie on them. So I have little stacks of them. Instead of throwing them away, um, I use them to just do hand mark of, of things that need to be done and that way I don't waste them. Um, next question. Adrian Albeck, BNE, is NDI output in Teams only available in a business account or all free accounts as well? I can't find the menu option anywhere despite Microsoft's help desk assistance. Go ahead, Paul. Yeah, it's in the meeting uh, policies menu. Click add and then scroll down to audio and video and fi find allow NDI streaming button and toggle it on. There you go. Next question. Next one comes to us from Paul Wallace again in Austin, Texas. For 2024, Apple is pan planning the iPad Pro's first major upgrade since 2018, featuring an M3, an OLED screen, and a Magic Keyboard with a larger trackpad. Is this enough? And he's got a big link there. Good, Paul. Yeah, I think it's enough. Uh, it's going to be a while, though. It'll be spring or summer before they release this. Yeah, I, I, I think that it's, it's, it's good for Apple to update it. Uh, I, I don't... There's so little that, I mean, we, we don't push our iPads very hard. I think that's the thing that I find is that I don't have a lot of apps on my iPad that, you know, I, I don't even know what I would do with an M3 on an, on an iPad. And so, so I did get an M1 and, and I think the things that are, we're starting to see push it are things like Final Cut and also things like Resolve, if Resolve adds more features to it. Um, although I think that the best use of Resolve on an iPad is really doing fast cuts, assemblies so you can see what's going on. And then you're going to send that back and you're being able to send a native uh, file back to your Resolve editor to be able to do something. Same thing with Final Cut. Although I, I'm not, Bill might be able to tell, tell us, is that the same? Is, is, can you save out that file, Final Cut file and, um, and just easily open it in the, the desktop version? Yeah, I think you can. It's not easily. Easily is a careful word here, but there is a way to export and then open it up in regular Final Cut. To me, just in this general question, I've always considered iPads to be content consumption devices from the when they first came out because it really was pretty hard to create much on them. But boy, now that they've been forced by the European Union to add a USB-C port rather than the old Lightning port, it's going to become a more content well, creation adjunct device. And I think that's really good for the ecosystem. System. I don't know if the EU has. I mean, the EU definitely has a has an impact on the iPhone. The 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 um, I think the iPad USB has been USB C yeah. for five years. Like it's not. I don't think that the oh. EU wasn't even talking about that when, when they moved over. I think a lot of that had to do with a large. You know, the the big problem with Lightning was the amount of uh, power that could be delivered to to charge it. So the, the iPad going to USB C early on really had to do with power. You know, getting getting enough power in there. I do think it's going to be interesting to see as we get out of beta um, is, you know, what we can do as far as devices being able to see it. I have been unable to get my ATEM to show up as a web camera on my iPad. <laughs> like I've tried it a couple times now and haven't quite figured that out. It's supposed to, um, but, I, but I haven't seen it show up as a webcam yet. Um, I think that that's a pretty exciting thing that it could be able to do. And hopefully that extra power would give us the opportunities to do that. What's funny is, is that I have been using my iPad as a creation device almost since day one. Like I don't, I very rarely watch a movie on it or watch anything on it. Um, I know a lot of people do. I think Bill's right that most people look at them as content um, uh, viewing devices, but I've been using them. I use them to build all my deck, my decks. I build them to draw. And the new app that I've been just obsessed with is Feather. Um, you know, Feather, the Feather app, um, uh, 3D sketchbook, and it is unbelievable like it and i just will i apologize ahead of time if you have an ipad and you download feather and you have a pen uh, i apologize for the five or six hours that you will lose on a on, a, on, a, on every other day like you open it up and, and it's just you're drawing you're sketching in 3d 
it's, it's amazing. Um, next question. Uh, Jan Fisher, John Fisher, excuse me, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. My home TVs are several years old. One of them is spontaneously began smoldering over the week. That is not good. What standards would you look for if you were replacing a bunch of home TVs in the near future? Go, ahead, Jason. Oh, boy. Well, it depends on how much money you have, really. Um, the first thing I would look for is if you can't spring for OLED, I would go for fall full array local dimming. And um, so that, if you look at the bottom right here, is is kind of uh, scattered backlighting for for a better for a better set of brights and dims. And then the second one would be Dolby Vision and Dolby Atmos. Those are the two that I, I just would not deal without. Yeah, go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, I think the uh, the OLED is uh, days are numbered. I think micro LEDs and other versions of a closer pitch. Uh, LED screens are going to work for you. But what I would do, particularly if you got a bunch of them to buy, is uh, do a lot of shopping. Don't be in a hurry to buy anything. And uh, watch the sales. If you can wait till January after the holidays, uh, that would be a great time because they're going to be very desperate to move those, uh, uh, those displays out of there. But all you need is a 4K and hopefully one from the non-smoking section. <laughs> yeah, and and I think that uh, the, the real time to get them is in the United States is right after the Super Bowl. About oh, two weeks after the Super Bowl, they're they're desperate to move those because they really bulk up for that supply. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, and right after the Super Bowl, a lot of people return them because they bought them for the Super Bowl and they want to get their money back. But yeah, look for something with the uh, mini LEDs with local dimming uh, and QLED, QLED, uh, the QLED series or the Quantum Dot. If it says Quantum Dot, that is the type of uh, filtration that it uses to create the RGB filters in front of that LCD. And it's a much more accurate uh, color rendition or brighter color rendition on them. Uh, so look for that. And bear in mind that most of the newer uh, TVs, a lot of the older ones had actually pretty decent speakers in them uh, because they have them at the bottom. You're probably going to need a sound bar for each TV because the speakers are now thin little skinny sounding ones that don't sound very good and they usually bounce off either shoot down the bottom and have to reflect off of something so you have to mount it in something that reflects that sound toward you or they shoot out the back and bounce off the wall so bear that in mind you're probably going to want to get a sound bar for each one too go ahead chris the thing i would look for is from a connectivity standpoint is the hdmi arc connector that might be totally common that everybody has that, but you really need that. And um, it, it'll give you a lot of um, control when you start connecting it to other things. I just read a um, or watched a YouTube video last night about how you can use uh, the HomePod minis, uh, get a couple of them. They're relatively inexpensive. You can gang them together and then you can force them through an Apple TV to be the default audio from that TV for whatever input you're playing. So even if you're playing a video game through it, it, it will force it through the HDMI, HDMI arc, which it's not actually connected to, which I don't understand. But those iPods will be, uh, uh, HomePods rather, will become the, I'm looking over here because it's over here, uh, will become the default audio source. And they sound pretty good. I mean, it's not like Alex's house, but, you know, if you're poor like me, you yeah, can I use those. Can you, are you, I'm not sure, I don't know if I track that about being able to it do it. It didn't make sense to playing, me. Listen, yeah, I'll I don't, I think, <laughs> I think someone I, might. So, I, so I think that I, I, I get being able to play video games on the Apple TV and being able to have that, those, it, it use those speakers. Um, and, but I don't know if I get, playing like your PlayStation 5 or something like that and being able to get to the speakers through the Apple TV. That doesn't track for well, me. Look, Alex, I'm going to be completely honest with you. I had a hard night last night. I, maybe I'd listened to it wrong, but <laughs> it sounded like that's what the guy was saying. Interesting. But the, Interesting. But the I, bottom I line is... All the pieces, I can trust it. Don't buy a TV without HDMI arc. And yeah. it could be called like eHDMI or something. Mm -hmm. and, and it basically, it allows you better connectivity through for... Um, outboard gear and sound sound stuff a r c is what they call it yeah the the um and uh yeah i would i would definitely dolby vision and atmos are, are should be a given i mean the atmos doesn't matter as much because it doesn't <laughs> but but it but vision is matters 
Um, the bottom, the problem I think the Dolby's had is that they've they've li- re- literally licensed it to you know just about everyone uh, if they're willing to look at their LUT, you know, and and so um, you would still want to look for a higher quality TV. 4K I think is fine up until about 85 inches, and then at that point you might benefit from an 8K. Uh, TV, um, you're really not going to see much difference between, you know, about 80, 85 inches and you're less than 10 feet away, which I'm less than 10 feet away from my, my, my TV. So it would make a difference. I don't have an 8K, but I, um, but the, but I think that the 4K is probably going to do you fine. Um, you do want to look for, uh, make sure it's got 120 frame per second. It prob- almost every TV does, but make sure that it doesn't skimp on that. Uh, you're going to see more content coming out at 120 over the next couple of years. You probably want to be future-proofed. I do agree with Courtney that you probably want to think about a sound bar. Um, the the best one, which will cost more than your TV, is the Ambio. Sennheiser's Ambio is just an unbelievable. I mean, it it is it is 95 percent of what I have in my house, uh, and I've got discrete speakers. You know, so so it's a really really incredible thing to look at. So I would I would definitely uh, take that into account. Next question. Rian Smith in Trinidad West Indies. Hi, what do you guys think about this relatively new system, the eMeet Stream Cam? I think it could be a game changer for small pros. And he's got links to both the product page and the user's guide there. Go, Jason. Yeah, I took a quick look at it. It looks pretty neat. Um, let me call your attention down to the back here. So the mic is removable, and I guess it depends on the quality of the microphone. If it sounds good, then great. You also have a quarter-inch jack in the back, so if if you can get the attenuation right, um, yeah, pretty neat for $250. Uh, not bad. Uh, it won't move around, but um, if you're streaming straight to YouTube, yeah, probably not bad. Good, Paul. Yeah, Sony came out with something almost exactly looking like this years ago. It's buried somewhere in my cargo container, but it looks it looks exactly the same. This was years and years ago. It's got a, the magnetic. It's got a magnetic microphone. It's Wi-Fi, so maybe Jason found out if you can bypass the Wi-Fi and, and use it wired. I don't know. There's a USB C jack in the back, so I'm not sure, but it's possible. Yeah, I would I would call this camera advanced consumer, probably not even quite prosumer. Um, so I think that we'd have to see what the mic is. The chip is a one over two point eight, so it's a basically a one third inch chip, which is not something that I would um, want to pay two hundred fifty dollars for. That's kind of there's a lot of cameras that are at at one hundred fifty dollars or less that do a one third inch chip. I mean, you really want to look at that chip size. Um, I also think that. Uh, I would highly recommend looking seriously in that price point, even though they don't necessarily have an ex- outboard mic, uh, I would still look at the uh, Insta360 um, Link or the Obspot Tiny Tiny 2. Those are the two that I've tested the most. I've tested most, ca- I haven't tested this camera, but I've tested most cam- most cameras out there right now, and those are by far um, the best solution. And I moved, I moved from having, I don't know, 10 or 20 Brios in the company um, so we, we, you know, we, we definitely have used a lot of these. And um, it, once you get to above the $200 threshold, I think that the Link and the, and, and the Obspot are the, are the two big winners. And still, from a creature comfort pr- perspective of software, I think that the Link runs better. Um, I think the Obspot has some extent, extensibility that you want to kind of think about. But I, don't, I wouldn't necessarily call it a game changer unless that mic is just unbelievable. And um, the problem the mic will have is physics you know, that you are going to be two or three feet away in a small capsule two or three feet away um, is still competing with the, the, you know, the laws of physics of how, of how things work and fall off. Uh, next question. Eric Hertz in Hartford, Connecticut is up next. The Sienna NDI processing engine RTMP streamer module outputs H.264 AAC. Can it also output the full NDI speed HQ video and raw audio without compressing it again? You know what I would do is I would this in this case um, we have an incredible NDI uh, discussion and and council showing up on Friday. So for this kind of question, and I know that some of them actually use Sienna, I would probably come bring this question back on Friday and ask them. I we can try to make an answer here, but I will tell you that you know world experts in NDI are going to be here on Friday. So if you have NDI questions for the first hour, you, you know they're going to be talking about a lot of different pipelines, but. Definitely bring this question back and ask it on Friday because I think there'll be a great 
Great, great discussion to, to be had there. A quick reminder that, of course, you can ask questions throughout the entire first hour. So if you've got questions, go ahead and throw them in. Um, and I'm going to put up a test for you guys to test. I don't know if I'd put a question in for it, um, but I'm going to throw up a test in here in, the, in a couple minutes for you to test our new, uh, what we call the drop, which is a way that you can ask questions without actually even logging into to, um, to Makana. So we'll, um, I have it just finished. I didn't quite get it loaded into my switcher before the day, but you'll see it pop up on my screen. I'll mention it here in a second. Uh, next question. Douglas Carmichael says, what plugins and or tools are the most useful for checking mono compatibility of a mix? Go ahead, Jason. Um, all right. So there are lots of ways to do this, but um, I'm going to switch over here and what you're seeing is Zenaptic Spectre 1, uh, which has been re-released. And if you call your attention to this circular one here called the stereo field that you can barely see because I'm coming through mono right now, um, that is straight down the middle. Right below it is a correlation meter. Combination of those two will pretty much give you exactly what you need. Go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, we used to use a uh, scope. Uh, to see that same uh, display, but uh, you could get that out of a WLM meter from Waves. Uh, we used them here on office hours, and uh, there are so many different ways. But I, I like that display, Jason. You get the uh, most bang for your buck for flash on that. You know, and I think that, yeah, I think that one of the things you want to do is, is uh, you know, find a way to fold it down to mono. Um, so that's really the, the thing to do within your DAW and then be able to listen to it if you're if you're working on it. So you want to be able to hear what what's actually going on there. Um, next question. Paul Wallace, Austin, Texas. Smart Answers, an AI chatbot trained only on Macworld, PC World, Tech Advisor, and TechHive content, will be offered to the outlet readers on August 1st. Is it a trend starter? And he's got a link there to the AI chatbot. Go ahead, Peter. Well, Paul, thanks for uh, bringing us to bringing that article to our attention. I always worry about a headline that has the word "smart answer" and user engagement in the same sentence. That usually is a little bit of a challenge. So, uh, looking at the article, its scope is pretty narrow. It's only four news um, uh, feeds. I tend to like a little broader. So, is it a trendsetter? I don't believe so, but it's a true statement that uh, the Google replacement will not look like Google to play Yogi Berra for a second. So I would turn your attention probably to two other things, uh, perhaps artifact.news. Uh, it's a great news feed driven by artificial intelligence. It's created by Kevin Systrom, ex Instagram founder, if that name is familiar, uh, or you.com. Again, you can pick your news feeds and you can really tune the results. So that's really what I would end up focusing on and get away from these sort of thin wrappers of API on somebody else's compute, go to a broader platform. Go ahead, Paul. Yeah, uh, the writers should take heart at this because really this doesn't replace writers. It, it makes more work for them. Yep. And I tested it out. I went to a few articles on Macworld and PC World. I discovered a couple of uh, really great outlets in Tech Advisor and mm -hmm. Tech Hive. They're pretty good. Yep. yep. And uh, you just put it in the information and it's, and the article becomes the tip of the iceberg and you yep. can ask questions about mm -hmm. things in the article you get more information. Yep. Maybe yep, this ahead, will John. help the writers. Yep, go ahead John. The word only here is a misnomer. You can't you can't train just with their content. You have to train on, on top of a foundational model first and then and then train it further with uh, specific data on top of that. That's all I wanted to add. Go ahead Courtney. I'd rather see it trained with the operation manuals from all equipment that has come out and has been featured in the Tech Advisor and PC World, uh, because uh, most of the articles in PC World, Mac World, and Tech Advisor are written by marketing people. So they may not be fully accurate or fully fleshed out as to what the capabilities of each individual item, if you're looking for information on a piece of hardware. Uh, I'd rather have it uh, ingest all of the operation tech, tech operation manuals of all those objects, then you would have something. Sample size is too small. <laughs> it's just too small. You're not going to get, you're never, it's not going to be competitive for the user. Um, so the user is not going to go to this. Even even working through uh, uh, hallucinations that Jet chat GPT may have, it's, this is not going to be competitive with the rest of the internet. Um, so I, don't, I think that it makes everybody feel good, but no one's going to use it. Uh, next question. Chris Fenwick, 
On Emeryville, California, up next, HDMI ARC to HomePod update. Does It actually does work. I'd like to show you. Chris? So, Alex, I completely uh, agree. Your take on that was, wait a second, that doesn't track. That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And I completely agree. But um, here it is. This is a frame grab from the guy's video. And it says down here, Apple TV will play audio, and, and this presumes the latest Apple TV and the latest uh, TV OS. Apple TV will play audio from your television and its inputs through your home theater HomePod speakers. Use your television's pass-through mode, blah, blah, blah. Also, I want to point this out. This is just uh, YouTube uh, frozen. Look at this. Did you know you copy text out of it? Uh, you, you're was, watching on you're on a uh, Apple on Apple devices. You can copy text out of pretty much anything you can see. Yeah, I did not did not realize that. But anyway, yeah, apparently this actually does indeed work as I as I thought. Well, I you haven't heard. tested it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> like, like, uh, you know what? I don't appreciate your attitude, and I'm going to ask you to move <laughs> to the back back of the class. Trust let's but let's verify. move on. But trust we're, we're, but verify. We're going to we're going to move on saying. now. Uh Bill, next question. <laughs> Go I ahead, just Bill. have to note, what it shocked saying? me too when I realized I could copy text out of a screen grab. It is freakish, but that's AI in the background doing a lot of things for you. You that's don't even AI. expect that's that's to do machine learning. Character right. Machine but learning. No, but I will whatever. say that blah, blah, it, blah. it's so much fun. I, I I I just use screen grabs all the time now. I don't try to cut and paste things because that you know, like the other day I was trying to grab some. I had to put some IP things over and back and forth, and I was like, oh, it won't select correctly, and I was like. Well, Heck with that, because you get into these things where they the device won't let you know the software won't let you select for whatever reason they don't put the copy in you know into the system for whatever security and with Matt, with Apple you just go capture and then you open it up in preview select thank you very much uh, yeah go ahead Jason I, yeah I can do you one better you can actually add um, right above the keyboard keyboard you can add text input and it will use the camera in real time to grab text it's maddening to use because to get the right amount of whatever you're trying to capture but yeah it, it works in real time and there's no AI involved go ahead Chris I was also going to say that uh, the video that I had watched that yes you're right I did not verify uh it's a guy by the name of Shane Watley, and he has a whole YouTube channel all about HomeKit stuff. You know, we were kind of talking about that the other day, and I've been getting, I wouldn't say deep into it, but I've been learning a lot about it. Uh, it's super interesting. Anyway, Shane, Shane Watley's uh, YouTube channel, really good. Next question. Josh Kaufman, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. When two or more teams need to mesh their projects together in a process or a new management tool set, what soft skills would be helpful in unifying company culture to rally around the new arrangements and environment? Go ahead, Ryan. So there is a, um, a an institution called ProSci, and they have a change management methodology called ADCAR. So that stands for Awareness, Desire, Knowledge, Ability, and Reinforcement. And there is a way to kind of assess a group's readiness for change and the different factions within the groups and their readiness for change and help lead them through that process. And if there's one thing I would call out about that process when it comes to the soft skills is it, 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 it's rooted in empathy, but but the specifics are really bringing everybody to the table and giving them input on what is the what are the elements of our culture, the elements of our uh, the rituals that we've historically followed that we uh, really do not want to see kind of stripped from us. And at the end of the day, if you bring everybody to the table and ask what's really critical to you and what are the things that you can give on, you're not going to see the groups on both sides of the table um, demanding that all of their elements are what are kind of retained in the final output, right? As long as they have the seat at the table, they're going to want to give as much as they are kind of trying to take in that uh, no negotiation. And you'll you'll find yourself in a spot where where compromise can be reached. Go ahead, Peter. Brian, your points about empathy and uh, rituals, absolutely critical. Uh, my history has been if you have a, a series of workshops with facilitation cards, there's a great site called facilitatorcards.com, oddly enough, and you can build some specific questions that will sort of draw out those empathetic questions and uh, get the team working together. The second, and it's a little corny for some people, but you can take uh, personality tests 
But the interesting part is not about the test, it's about what you do with the test. Meaning I've had workshops where you actually line people up in the opposite uh, order of your personality ranking, empathy, um, extrovert, introvert. And that really creates some really interesting conversations as well. So it's all about getting people together in a neutral territory and creating a new sets of rituals. Yeah, I think that one of the things that uh, in large companies that you have to do is is you have to give it time to to settle, you know, and and you know that the advantage of a small company is that you can move fast and you know and do all these things. But I think when you move, one of the big things that I see culturally, I've worked in a lot of small companies and I've owned a small company and then I've worked in a lot of big companies as well. And the thing that you have that that I see when people come in from a smaller group to a larger group is that they wanna move at the same pace and it just doesn't work that way. <laughs> you just, you know, you have to, there's a lot of like getting everybody involved because it's really easy for people who don't agree with where you're going to simply just add drag to the event, add, add drag to, to um, what you're trying to do. <laughs> and they can do it in very, very subtle ways and it just kind of just slows everything down. Um, and so you really have to find a way to get um, buy-in from a lot of different stakeholders and you have to understand that they have reasons for wanting it to be the way it is. And some some are good and some are maybe sometimes not as good, but they still have reasons and they still have leverage and they still have weight. And so you have to figure out what, you know, how you're going to do that. Sometimes it's, most of the time, it's finding a way that everyone agrees with what you're doing. Sometimes it is building up enough con enough consensus to move it forward, but it is, it, you know, and sometimes that means bowling over somebody, you know, which you just have to know that that's a, that it may, may have long-term consequences that you can't see at that moment, you know? So especially people who have been in a company for a long time often got there and, and they're in that position uh, through an enormous amount of connections and understanding of how the, how the mechanics work. And so you just, you know, with when you start to do these things, I think the thing that I see most people make mistakes on and I've made those mistakes is, is really, you know, feeling like you're, you're looking at it from your point of view, not from everybody else's point of view of what that looks like. And you have to really figure out how to understand from there. And that gets back to exactly what was just what was just talked about, which is that that comes back to, it's not just giving people input, but really, really hearing them. You know, like really hearing what what are they, you know, because you're, you're trying to calculate when you're listening to them, you are, you're not just listening, you're not just like opening it up so that we can all talk and now I'm gonna tell you what to do, but you're listening to them of, you know, there are, you know, again, I I've used this in the past, but there is, you know, action will always occur, not sometimes, but always will occur when possibility is greater than circumstance. When you're in that conversation, you are listening for the person's, the possibilities, what makes their job better? What makes them more fulfilled? What gets the company moving forward that they can see? And the circumstances, what do they see as the, as the roadblocks? And those are the two things you're constantly looking for. And then you got to figure out how does your solution minimize the minimize the circumstances or at least not make them worse and increase the possibility. And if you can figure those things out, um, then, you know, for each person. And so it's really like a calculus problem. There's a whole bunch of whole bunch of people and you've got to figure out a solution that solves that for everyone. And, and people who are really good at it are uh, good project managers. <laughs> Go ahead, Ryan. So a, um, a, a person's and a team's um, capacity for change is something that can actually be measured via a pretty simple assessment and a, and a questionnaire. And so when we think about the empathy equation and trying to understand an individual's desires and important, you know, and, and, and how that will affect your ability to kind of get them on board, understanding just how much change they can absorb and at what pace they can absorb it is really important. So if you understand it to not be that great and there's a merger taking place, right, then typically how that's handled is that the merger takes place and none of the processes change in the short term. And you wait for a lot of those initial kind of challenges to be worked out. And then after some kind of uh, period of time, that's when we start to work on uh, tool consolidation or process consolidation so that we don't overwhelm and lead to, you know, the, the, the most um, unfortunate outcome really being, being untimely attrition. I love that word. I was just thinking about sometimes that's, that's the way that untimely attrition, otherwise laying off half the, half the team so that you can move, move the thing forward. And I've seen it happen in companies where a team thinks that they have a lot of leverage and they slow everything down. And then at some point someone just goes, 
hey, we're all we're making a big change and we're going to change. It's usually not that division only. It's usually a whole bunch of divisions and they all just kind of clear, clear, clear away things that have been stopping them. So on the other side of people that are in these companies, you have to be very careful of that as well. For uh, next worth, Alex, I was really referring to, you know, resignation more so than oh, okay. to lay, lay folks off. But I mean, you're, you're right in either case, right? If it's not working, then that's the, uh, that's the other outcome that's un, un, unfortunate. In my, in my younger years, 30 years ago, um, I had a lot of roadblocks at a radio station I've talked about in the past. And I, I let go of the entire air staff to move it forward. <laughs> so, so like it was in, as a 21 year old, I was just like, I, I need, I need, I can't go forward without this. It was not one of my better days. So um, anyway, and uh, never laid another person off for another 30 years. <laughs> so, so anyway, uh, next question. Douglas Carmichael is up next with the M series processors in the iPad Pro. Do you think we'll see a touch friendly Mac OS in the future? Uh, go ahead, uh, Jason. Not more so than it already is. I mean, if you want to be able to touch with your iPad, we already have that. It's um, you just extend your desktop and boom, there's your touch interface. I think that the power and um, the reason that they're being upgraded has to do with wanting to standardize on a code base and to, to simply just keep it current, um, probably also uh, increasing the standard, for, possibly from USB-C to, to Thunderbolt, but that's, that's a reach. Go ahead, Courtney. Uh, I would say no, because uh, the reason they are keeping touch off of Mac OS is to make you buy that M-based <laughs> Uh, iPad, and they'll sell another $1,000 device for the people that want to have touch in a portable uh, type device, and they sell you the keyboard and touchpad, so it turns it into kind of like a, a laptop, and that way they can sell two laptops instead of just one. Yeah, I don't, I, I will say that I, I just don't think Apple thinks that way. I know a lot of people think that they do. I just don't think that they do. Um, they think about the best tool for what, they're, what they want to do, and they look at, I, I just can tell you that I've had a lot of interaction. <laughs> I just don't, they just, that's, not, that's not at all what they're, they're thinking. They're not thinking about how to get you to do two things. What they're trying to do is build a unified experience, and they decide where they're going to focus energy on each thing. And it doesn't, you know, and, and that they want them all to work together, but they, all, they want them all to solve a certain problem. And the iPad has always been touch-based. Um, I think that they... I think I, I do think that Apple looks at at the Mac as as kind of a legacy product that they need to continue to support. So I think that there's not. I mean, they they definitely add more more features to it, but it's a, such a tiny part of their market. They don't. I think that they just um, you know. So I don't think that I think they're just not willing to invest what it would take to move the interface forward because they've got a lot of other fires and they're just not that interested in it. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, I think it really boils down to resolution, doesn't it? Because if you're going to change the whole, if you're going to, if you're going to give the Mac OS the full touch experience, I mean, just look at any window on your screen with the three little dots up in the corner. Those dots are going to have to be much further apart and much bigger, and it's going to be well. It's it, it's also just that every interface that that runs on a on a Mac program uh, wants to be every interface that's out there. Uh, you know, isn't built for that. To your point, the, it's not so much the resolution of the screen, but it's the it's the it's how big. No, I'm not talking is. about the resolution of the screen at oh, all. Got it, I'm yeah. talking about the resolution of the way the uh, the the applications are designed. Yeah, the Mac is designed to be a you know a power user's tool where I got to do a lot of things. I got to have a lot of buttons. I got to have a lot of resol. <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of resolution to do a lot of very fine work. I'm getting into arguments in the office over this pixel versus the one next to it. Do that with this yeah. input device. It's funky. So I don't, maybe at the simplest thing, like I want to grab a window and swipe it away, you know, uh, Tom Cruise style, but really working on it. I don't, I don't think so. Yeah. I, I think that that's the, I mean, I think the real issue is, is that there are so many things that I go back to the Mac to do. Like I can't, like Keynote, I love Keynote, and there are so many cool features in the Keynote version of the, uh, on the iPad. But I, you know, I write notes on, in Notes, and then I open up Keynote on the iPad, and I sketch my, my frames, and then I take it to the Mac, and I finish it. And then I, you know, sometimes display it on the iPad. But because the iPad just isn't the, the fine-tuning, to your point, uh, you know, on that, that, not even just a different app, it's just the it, resolution doesn't make any sense. Yeah, go ahead, Bill. 
Yeah, to me, I'm, I'm getting more and more niche in terms of what am I doing right now? I don't use my computer all the time as its general purpose. Now, when I'm editing video, absolutely. My entire focus is keyboard and, con, you know, uh, shortcuts and things like that and editing on a timeline on one screen. But now I'm doing a lot more narration work and I move over and I've got a script over here. I'm barely touching my keyboard at all. And I'm working for hours at a time getting productive work done without the mode that I was in before having any interest to me at all. And then when I get something that I have like office hours where I've got three or four screens going, everything, every task has its own arrangement that that uniquely helps me be efficient. And I see more and more of that coming in my life as I do different kinds of things. Some people do the same task all day long, and God bless you, uh, you want the thing that's optimized for you. But I just find myself compartmentalizing more and more, and I don't need the same tool for each working in each compartment of my working day. That's how I see it. Good, Paul. Yeah, my tech sources uh, say that uh, Apple denies it, but uh, Mac Rumors says it's for sure. Bloomberg says it's for sure well, that I think, Apple I don't is think, working on this. I don't think that Apple denied it. I think that they just, they don't, they don't, they just don't They're minimizing it. Well, they just don't, they just no, don't, we're they, not working on this. No, they, that's not what they said. <laughs> that, that's not accurate. Uh, the, it is what, what, what Apple how Apple responds to all of these is no comment. They don't say that they're no not comment. working on okay. something or working on something, but they just, they don't comment on anything that they're working on, but they don't say, oh, we're not working on it. Of course they're working on a new iPad. Um, you know, when it comes out and what it looks like is is what they're not going to give you any any data on. They say that whether it's happening or not happening. Uh, go ahead, Craig. So my main monitor, it's a 40 something inch uh, screen. I hooked up a infrared uh, frame around it. So I've been using touch on Mac OS uh, as as part of the interface. And, you know, as Chris said, it's a lot of little widgets and buttons. The resolution is really tight. Also, if you're going to work on touch, you want it at a low level. So like a tablet, you're not reaching up and getting the gorilla arm issues. Uh, but I'd say that's one of the big issues is it's that from a precision standpoint, it's not there. And a lot of the activities that you want to do, you want a lot more fine tuned precision that a touchpad or a mouse is going to give you. Go, Courtney. Yeah, adding touch to an operating system like Mac OS doesn't r really remove anything or reduce any any of its operability because you don't have to use touch. You still use the mouse for all the fine tuning stuff on the OS. But what it does give you, and having used touch on Windows for the last five or six years, on all all of my laptops have touch on them. Although I primarily use the mouse for them for most stuff. However, I find going to a web page and be able to scroll up and down or move or left or right by touching the screen is very handy to have and it doesn't require a level of precision that you need. So just adding touch to the operating system doesn't detract from its use. If you want to make it only touch, that would be a problem. But adding touch to a conventional mouse operating oper operating system doesn't remove anything. So they may do it, but like I say, it's a bad marketing move. No, I, I think that they just don't, I just don't think they don't, they don't, they're not willing to invest the amount of work it would take to do it, to do a touch screen at Apple's level and to make sure that it doesn't get, you know, returned or little issues or people complaining about it. You know, opening that door is something that I just think that they don't, they're not that interested in doing. Um, and I think that, I, I don't think it has anything to do with trying to get, sell you two things. I think they just think they have it a box that it sits inside of, um, you know, and, uh, and they, and they just don't feel like taking it out of that box. Um, next question. Next question comes to us from Dave Troutman in Edmonton, Canada. The Instalink camera has an HDR output option. Is this something which would improve my video in Zoom calls? Go ahead, Paul. I have not had very good luck with the HDR option. It's just every time I've tried it, and, I, and I'm on a that camera right now, Not for whatever reason, it's a no-go for me. You go ahead, Ryan. My experience is when you turn the HDR setting on with the Insta360 link, you then lose the ability to manually adjust white balance and uh, exposure and contrast and the like. Yeah, it's it's not really HDR as much as it is tone mapping. So it's taking a higher exposure that's coming into the camera and then basically compressing that down. And that process then takes away a lot of, as, as Ryan said, a lot of control that you have over it. Uh, I've turned, I've learned to turn it off. <laughs> like it's, it's a good, it's a nice marketing thing. 
in an area where you have bright colors and dark shadows, it may give you a slightly better image that you can see more detail in those areas. Um, but I prefer to just manage that with light. Um, so, so I think that that's, you know, especially for the way that you use those cameras, um, I don't know if you need it as much as, as you would, you would think. Um, but I haven't found that, as Paul said, I haven't found that it's been particularly useful. Uh, next question. Douglas Carmichael is up next. If you wanted to improve the video quality of a church stream without the budget for dedicated camera operators, would you start with a fixed camera or a pan tilt zoom camera? Go, ahead, Bill. I'm taking your question at face value. You say the video quality, and I'm not sure uh, those choices, other than the raster and ability of the camera to produce a good picture, is going to affect video quality. Now, if you're talking about production quality, that's a different thing. Uh, you mentioned specifically camera operators, so you must be interested in having like smooth moves and things that do increase production quality. Uh, so in that case, a fixed camera is not going to get you what you want. Some kind of a high-end pan to tilt zoom where you can get similar to human operator moves will increase the, the visual quality of your production. But if it's just for what you're saying here, which is you're looking to improve the video quality, it's going to be camera resolution and lighting that's going to do that more than anything else. Go ahead, Paul. Yeah, I, I would, at a minimum, I'd use the Insta360, but I'd go to like a bird dog or an advanced PTZ if your budget allows it. Yeah, the, the, you're going to get a lot more. I mean, a lot of times we work, do a lot of these events uh, where we have, um, uh, where we have multiple, multiple PTZs can get you through a lot. Um, the place that you have to watch having a PTZ is where you have to follow someone. So if you're watching someone come on, so we have a, events that we do with interviews um, and uh, what we have is four PTZs and one hand, one operated camera. And that operated camera is really designed to get the walk onto the stage. It's very hard to follow someone with a PTZ that way. So, um, so we have, you know, but it does reduce the number of people that we have. And for us, some of it's expense, but a lot of it has to do with, it's just a lot cleaner for the audience. We're right in front of a lot of people and we can put those cameras up nice and close if they're PTZs where they might have to be much further back if they were operators because the people get in the way and everything else. And so we can put these little PTZs up and have them you know, wrapping around there. And we've been very successful with it. Um, I prefer PTZs over operators for most things that where people aren't moving. And that has to do with in interviews, especially it, PTZs are a lot less, they fall into the background a lot faster than the operators. Operators have a bad habit of you know, just moving around, <laughs> like being human beings. Um, and, and so when they're in a close quarter with a, with an audience, um, that becomes problematic. Now in a, in a church setting, you may have them in the back anyway, and then you need long throws. I do a lot of stuff where I put my cameras right up in the front because I'm, I'm serving the online audience as a primary, um, as the primary, not the secondary, uh, audience. Um, next question. Next one comes from Alex Lindsay in Nevada, California. I set up an Alex listener for After Hours. Can I describe how and why? I can. <laughs> if people wanted to vote on it. Uh, yeah, Paul, you wanted to say something? Yeah, absolutely. Let us know. And, and uh, yeah. I have something similar. I use Rewind AI, and it listens to everything I... I do and reports back to me on well, what I said and all that. I'm not listening to myself. This is a, you know, like I'm listening to office to office hours. And what I did is, so the issue that I found that I had with after hours is, is that I, is that I found I wasn't going on because it was like, well, it's on this computer or it's on, um, you know, this computer I'm doing work on it, or I have to have other meetings here and I have to do other things. And there was like this lift of it being there running while I was doing other work. And there was a lot of other things that I kind of put together. And the reason I wanted to talk about it a little bit is because people, other people might be interested in doing something like this. But so what I did is I, um, I got a little melee, um, one of the, one of these, uh, these little folks here. Um, so I have this, um, and it is, uh, attached. Thank you, Courtney. Um, and it is, uh, it, so it just, it's connected to the internet, you know, it's not nothing special. And, um, and then what it does is it, it's got its headphone out is going out to actually, uh, it's a stereo out to two XLRs, which I converted one of them to a quarter inch and I put it in the back of this Roland. I don't know what, I don't know what the brand is. It, Roland makes a box, a big speaker that I like this big by this big. And, um, it, it is, uh, 
uh, I found it in my office. In my, I, I'm sure we got it for something at some point, but I, I found it in my garage. So I put it in um, and it's got um, a bunch of channels that can go into it. Um, so then what I did is I, so that that's where the audio goes. I don't have mics or cameras set up yet and I'm not sure if I will. This is really, I kind of don't want to accidentally turn it on. This is really just for me to listen to what's going on and I can jump into something if I want to talk about it. But um, I may turn it, I may make it something more, but we'll see. Um, anyway, uh, so it, and then it goes to one of my monitors um, and uh, I'm setting it up now in my router so that I can just route the monitor on and off. Right now I have to plug it and unplug it. Um, and uh, anyway, so so I have a monitor here that is either to my Mac or, or one of the four monitors on my Mac or it's this PC. And really, it just go sits full screen um, in that in that state. And what I did is I the 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 speaker is um, powered, and so I put the speaker into a Eve um, uh, uh, outlet and tied that into shortcuts, <laughs> so I can just turn it. If I want to listen, all I got to do is say the word, and it will just. Uh, turn on and start, it'll, you know, go live. So it, it cause it turns the, it, cause I'm in zoom all the time, but I can just turn the speaker on and off um, as needed. And so it's a really, so I've gotten it kind of in a automated fashion where I can very, very quickly and easily just turn it on and be listening and turn it off. And it's always there. I don't have to really think about logging in or logging out, which is again, I think something that um, uh, was keep, I was just trying to find what's the friction of me just having something in there where I can listen to it. And I, I found that those were the friction points that I solved. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, I have something similar where I, I have the, uh, I just use the ice cast on the uh, uh, Makana mobile to listen and I have it running through an amplified speaker. But I, I saw that Alex listener listed last night uh, as one of the panelists on After Hours. And I thought, oh, I see what he's doing. It's a scarecrow. It's to make you think that Alex is always listening. You never know when Alex is going <laughs> to keep everybody on their P's and Q's and keep everything it's really decent just, and after just, hours. So I can, just to scare folks. What, what happens is, is that like sometimes someone will send me like, hey, we're talking about this thing. Oftentimes Mitch will send me something like we've got somebody in the in the, in the the uh, after hours. You might want to jump in. And I look at it and I'm like, oh, you know, like I've got a bunch of things opened and I the, the, the lift for me to jump right in would be too high. And this is the kind of thing where I can just turn it on and make it go and not have to think about it. Yeah, go ahead, Mitch. Yeah, to Courtney's point, I, I will admit I was in after hours yesterday, I think it was, and um, I was going my normal uh, way on after hours. And all of a sudden I looked over and I said, Alex. And it was like, <laughs> it was just like, it was just the idea that it was there. Mickey used to pull a stunt once in a while that used to get me when I used to go yeah. off off the rails that he'd pop a picture of you frowning. So I think you need like, I, I think know, you need some that. emojis. To, uh, I there. think that that'll be an opportunity for shortcuts somewhere, but that's, I we need a Mac for that. So I'd have to change that around. So I have to think, I'll have to think about that. But yeah, having something that I could quickly give, uh, yeah, like a little, little hand or, or something like that, that would be, that'd be good. So we'll, we'll see, we'll see how that progresses. Next question. Douglas Carmichael says a Norwegian railroad engineer and YouTuber swapped her Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 6K for a Sony FX3, and she said the FX3 has, quote, much better noise and visibility in tunnels. Why would that be? And there's a link there. Go ahead, Mitch. Well, a low light level uh, operation. Uh, it's a full frame uh, sensor. Um, and in a word, color science, uh, Sony seems to have that down very well. Blackmagic is a nice camera. It just has a different color science. Same thing is that Sony might beat um, Arri, for example, in some of the specifications and low light, but they don't beat Arri's uh, color science. So it's, uh, it's, there's so many different things that can affect the ultimate visual look of that, uh, of that camera. I'll have, to look at the, I'll have to look at the footage. I would say probably that they don't know how to use the LUTs correctly. Um, you know, I don't think that the difference between the FX3 and the FX uh, and the and the Black Magic are are significant. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, I think with the lower resolution Sony's, they have a, a higher gain and a larger photo transistor size that they can fit in there, so they can gather more light with less noise. Yeah, and I just that's why their their noise figures are lower at lower light. You can pump them up a lot better with that. The, the FX3 noise. is a it's, full it's, full frame yeah. sensor. Full frame, uh, but how many pixels versus 6K? Right, yeah. Full frame will get you some more, especially if you're going down to 1080. Um, next question. Next question comes from St. David Brady in New York City. What's the maximum length a 3.5 millimeter IR emission line receiver can be extended before the global cache needs to be employed? Go ahead, Jason. 
Oh boy, I went all the way down a rat hole on this one. And um, the answer is because it's an analog circuit, it, it just depends on the pulse modulation, the frequency, and the kind of pulse that needs to be relayed. Um, I could not get a clean answer because I always use Balance for this. Like I just I use Ethernet if it's long and that's it. Next question. Next one comes from Tommy Shantz in St. Paul, Minnesota. In a live stage music video production, what would be a better solution for a handheld roving camera? He has Micro Four Thirds in the forms of GH5s and GH4s, a Sony EX1R, or what would you suggest all going into an ATEM? Um, you know, I think that the, the the main thing that you want to look at is how are you going to manage focus and how are you going to stabilize it. Um, so these are all fine. I mean, you can do handhelds. The EX1 is a is an easy one. It's a little old in the tooth. Um, so the e, but if you're going to pick between those, um, you know, the G the G4 the GH5 and the GH4 are going to look nicer. Um, uh, or and the EX1 is going to be easier to probably handle. It's a more of an ENG style camera. Um, but there's probably newer ones from Sony than the EX1R. I don't know what they are. I don't really use those much anymore. But, but the um, but what you're looking for is something you know. Again, some of the other Sony's may be really good with great autofocus if you want to lean on that while you're doing it. But if you want to manage manual focus, um, that becomes a you know more complex thing. And again, the question is, are you really doing handheld or are you doing stabilized? And really, it's going to come down to the rig around it um, and what you're going to build there. Now, next question. Next question comes from Josh Kaufman in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Live event for a Zoom audience for a single on-site operator. A Sure BLX wireless mics receiver into an ATEM Mini with a 1 8 inch adapter. Will ATEM Mini Pro audio input be usable to sync with video? Also, he wants to know about a mix minus for the Zoom questions to on-site. Um, as soon as you start doing mix minus, I would really recommend getting a real mixer. So as soon as you say, I want to do mix minus in a room, you want to, you want to start at a X32. Like I just, uh, we've done a lot of it. When you do, you know, again, if it's going to be, you're going to have open speakers and open mics, you need a Dugan Auto Mix to do that. Um, and so you need to have that there. Uh, you might be able to get, get away with a, um, the XR18, uh, but the way that it does delay and and a lot of its things, it uses them as FX patches and it drives me crazy. So I, that's why I don't use them very much for that. Um, you know, I, again, uh, live event with people in the room that you're going to broadcast out that to me, that to me, that shows up like a real show and a real show is not putting audio into your ATEM, <laughs> like, you know, like it's like into your ATEM mini or, or anything else like that. I just, I wouldn't use the eighth inch jacks. I wouldn't use any kind of unbalanced input into a, into a um, computer for a show that's in front of a lot of people that's going to then be streamed out to a lot of people. Um, that seems like it'll be dangerous. Um, next question. Ronnie Hofsoy in Tromsø, Norway, not including the email client out of Redmond. Which Mac email client client is a favorite and why? Go ahead, Jason. For me, it's it's mail dot app or nothing at all. I I've just always used the Mac Mail app, and and I've been pretty impressed until you get over an an incredible amount of. Um, of email, the database is about as solid as, as just about anything out there. Good, Peter. Product uh, called Spark, uh, oddly enough, out of Ukraine, um, does a great job, uh, does a nice job with the UI and is uh, very gentle on the eyes. So that's one I recommend. And again, it's not Mac specific, but superhuman. If you're on uh, Gmail, it's just a fantastic uh, tool for parsing and processing email. Go, Jason. I've got one more if you're desperate. Thunderbird, last time I checked, a couple years ago, works really well on macOS. Yeah, the one thing that I, I will say, I, I use mail, um, but it, it, there are some idiosyncrasies to it. So uh, primarily how it relates to uh, Exchange. So if you're dealing with a lot of people with Exchange servers, uh, mail is a little bit uh, tweaky. So um, the way it displays it, especially in dark mode, is very can be very hard to read. People, if you have a lot of people with Exchange servers, and the way that it stacks Exchange uh, up is can be painful um, to work with. And finally, if you have filters that move your your mail into a into a folder on the on the drive, um, when you use um, when you, when you get an exchange message, oftentimes it'll tell you that the message got there, but it'll say it'll have no content. So um, so exchange and, and mail do not get along super well. 
Um, so that's if you have if you're in an exchange company, you may want to think hard about that. I still use it, but I know kind of know what the idiosyncrasies are. And when people get into a discussion between two people with exchange, it takes a lot more lifting for me to keep up with what's actually going on. A uh, quick reminder that we have a great, great week this week. Uh, Stu Mashwitz, my old office mate at ILM, is going to be here tomorrow to answer your questions. He's going to talk about his journey, talk about how he got there and what he's done since ILM. Uh, he's done a lot. So, um, so Stu, it's, we're really excited to have Stu on the show tomorrow. Um, we also, on Wednesday, we have uh, object-based editing with Robert Scovel. Um, it's really incredible to have Robert on as well. So we're really looking forward to that for our sound day. Of course, Tuesday's our graphics day. And then for for our video day, we've got David C. Smith from platepros.com. Um, and and uh, Plate Pros, of course, do the background plates that you see in in shows and a lot of movies and so on and so forth. So he'll be talking about how that gets done and answering your questions. And then, as I said before, we've got an incredible lineup um, for NDI workflows. And so this is going to be the day, the day for you to ask questions about NDI, <laughs> to talk to people about it, to ask them. And of course, Saturday and Sunday will be Q&A. Um, and so, uh, so it's, keep, stay tuned for that. And now we're going to jump into the second hour. Thank you. Alex, uh, so today we're going to talk a little. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> so we're jumping into the second hour. Uh, yeah, so um, thanks, everybody. We're jumping into the second hour, and we're really excited. As I said before, we're really excited to have um, an incredible set of experts here uh, that are going to um, be talking. Ryan Raderman, Peter Buck, Craig McFarland, Mark Giuliani, and and Mark, of course, got caught up in our new our new pipeline, which is going to – the reason we're doing the new pipeline is is because we're trying to figure it out. And, of course, we're, we're finding little sharp edges everywhere while we, before we actually needed to work there. So so anyway, so we want to um, thank, uh, um, you know, thank everybody. We're really excited to have it. And I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to, to Mark and uh, have him give us a little bit of an overview uh, of, of what we're talking about today. Go ahead, Mark. All right. Thank you, Alex. Um, so today we're going to talk about uh, lessons from architecture and construction as they re involve project management. Peter Buck, Craig McFarlane, Ryan Raderman, and myself have worked uh, on this, and we've worked on it with Josh Kaufman. So we'd like to thank Josh about that. And what we thought we'd talk about today is a little bit about uh, the differences between design bid build, which is the traditional way architects have designed buildings and contractors have built them for owners, and what's... Uh, the new transition to what I think is going to be the future of construction, which is design build. We'll walk through the stages of design and construction. We'll talk a little bit about risk and finance and safety and the transition of these tools during the transition from paper, a paper industry, which was just up until a few years ago, to the digital industry. So if we start with design bid build, you basically have an owner over here and then you have an architect here. And I'll fill in the rest of this in a few moments. But an owner will go out to an architect. An architect will work on pre-designed services, which may be including getting land for the project. It'll be situating a building on the site. It'll be putting that building on the site. And if the owner also will have used the building instead of leasing it out, they'll work with those user groups. And they'll work with the user groups to find out how to program the building, how to put the building floor plans together, how to create what we call bubble diagrams and blocking and stacking diagrams, and the building will start to take a shape. And then from there, you go to different phases. So you'll have that, those would be pre-design services, and then you'd have schematic design services where you start to see the plans. In design development services, you'll start to see things fill into those rooms and that'll follow with construction documents. And construction documents, sometimes called contract documents, are the documents that will go out to bid under design bid build procurement procedures. And that is where different contractors will put pricing together. They'll talk with their subcontractors and they'll come back to the owner with the price. The owner and the architect will then select how, which contractor it may be. And there's different ways to do this. Sometimes they'll throw out the low bid, throw out the high bid, and pick a bid in the middle. Sometimes it won't necessarily be about price at all, but it'll be about prior experiences and the quality of the, the builder in those relationships. So once that's done, you have a contractor gets picked, and that contractor has a, an agreement with the owner. 
So the architect has an agreement with the owner. The contractor has an agreement in a, with the owner, but there's no agreement between the architect and the contractor. So what happens is you're out on a job site, you're representing the owner, and you're trying to make sure that the building's being built per the design documents. And there's no way for you to really talk to the contractor and direct the contractor because there's no contracts there. So what happens is you have to go report back to the owner. The owner has to then go to the contractor. It becomes this very hard to work with triangle. In the other scenario, you have design build. And in design build, you'll have an owner and then you'll have a team. And that team will be the contractor led design build team, which will have a design team here and we'll have a whole group of some contractors here. The difference in this and how this affects project management is that this team is working much earlier on in the project. So the design team will work hand in hand with the subcontractors designing the facility. And what this means is you have a team working together. There's one point of contact for the owner and that owner is now working as part of the team, working with all the different individuals and it just changes the whole flow of the project. It saves time, it saves budget, and it reduces the amount of risk. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. Now, how has that changed project management? Well, it's changed project management primarily in a way that technology's changed. So instead of having an owner and an architect working together on paper in servers that, you know, as I came into the practice, everybody had on-site servers, they were just developing AutoCAD, uh, it was very crude. Today, we're using, a lot of times, we're using cloud-based BIM models, which are building information modeling models, and we will put the whole building together. We'll pick from different assemblies. So instead of drawing two lines to represent a wall like we used to do 10 years ago, we'll pick an assembly that will say, this is a three and five eighths inch stud, two layers of drywall. All of that database is now built. So you know exactly how many square feet of drywall there are. You know what the price of the drywall is. And so as you put these things together, you have a cost for the building. And you can start to basically go through all of this. And, and I think that, so that, that Ryan's going to talk a little bit about how all of this comes together and how the different tools we use to do this work. Well, and just to ask you a couple, uh, one question. And one of the things that's really important here is, isn't, isn't it that the, the, margins are very low in construction. I mean, you know, I think that that's the, I think that, I think folks, I mean, for a lot of folks, is that, is that true, Mark? So, well, not being a contractor, I don't know the final numbers that we never see the final numbers, but I will say this, there's a huge amount of risk because if you're starting a project and you've bid a bunch of, let's say, uh, drywall or chipboard or steel studs, you have, you're paying a price, that price could go up by the time you actually go to take delivery on them. And that's really impacts the whole budget for the contractor. Go ahead, Ryan. Alex, what I would um, you know add to that point is that while there is inherent risk in construction projects because of the sheer amount of budget that's involved, right? I mean, if we think about a typical tower in a downtown area that's 20 stories in, in height, we're talking about a $100 million project. Um, you know, a lot of these tool sets, of course, are designed to try to mitigate as much of that risk as possible. And so some early examples were that when you were talking about some of the trades like MEP, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, you would run into an issue where there was a, a, a finite amount of space that those different um, you know, components of the building systems were competing for. And so it, you always have an order of operations for the different trades to work in. And, and depending on which one came first, you know, there'd end up being space occupied that they were counting on. And so BIM is a really important software category in the architecture and construction process that I, I think we'll get to talk a lot about today. When you think about BIM, collision detection was the first scenario that really helped get the return on investment um, equation right for organizations that were deciding. They and when you say collision invest. detection, when we say collision detection, that's like a physics model of two things colliding with each other. But you're really talking about teams. We're, we're really talking about the physical Oh, really? collisions that could result between a pipe and a conduit oh, right. for networking cable, for example, right? And so, um, you know, the, the, these BIM tool sets actually kind of existed before there was a 
a financial feasibility to an architecture firm or a general contractor investing in the talent and in the servers and in the software that were necessary for it. But that's where the MEP contractors came in and said, you know what, we've got a real use case here. So, so that's what got digitized. But remember that design and is, actually... And, and just for the folks listening, BIM is bi building information model, right? Or you modeling. So you figuring out exactly, you know, all the, you know, basically the metadata you know, of, of the building. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and it starts to give you the ability to visualize what the completed project is going to look like, right? So you've got the ability to visualize the exterior and maybe different spaces in the interior, but then, you know, zooming in and peeling away the walls, proverbially, proverbially right, to see what it is that's behind them. But remember that architecture and design happens in an office. And so what's gotten really interesting here is that you know, that's been able, um, you know, that's been feasible for, for more than a decade. But what hasn't been feasible is project management software that extended out into the field, right? You could have the project management guys in the trailer that were looking at a Gantt chart of how the project was going to play out. But the ability to actually collaborate in real time with what is playing out in the field keeping in mind a couple things, right? The job site moves every day. Even if we're building a tower, you know, one week to the next, we're, we're moving our way up a different floor. If we're building a highway, we're physically move, moving ourselves one mile at a time down a, you know, down a distance. And uh, as you can imagine, in a manufacturing scenario, we were able to get shop floor software working much more easily in a controlled environment where we weren't dealing with weather, where we had network connectivity that we could drop right to the point. We could have a fixed in-place workstation. But this required, um, you know, the, the, it required good mobile connectivity, good mobile devices, and most importantly, proficiency on the part of these different um, people in the trades. And so the demographic shift that's taking place here in 2023 is really opening um, a, a window, right, where, where we're seeing the pre-existing workforce kind of getting to retirement age, aging out and becoming replaced with people that aren't as good at the skills that, you know, you were used to, um, you know, with, with the technical elements of of building something, right, but are more tech savvy and willing to kind of engage in in the collaboration required between what's happening on site um, from a progress standpoint, but also from a detailed kind of question and answer standpoint. And that's where Procore and Autodesk build our, our two key uh, software tool sets that are, are really taking off. I was at a conference last week and Mark and I were exchanging notes from, um, from that uh, Association of General Contractors technology conference where, of course, there's a lot of talk about AI and how that's going to transform the construction industry, but also a lot more uh, pragmatic discussion about just the the little bits of efficiency from better communication between between the office and the field. So we'll uh, definitely keep an eye out for questions from there. Uh, yeah, Ryan, I think just to take a go, step back yeah, for ahead. a second on your class, you talked about clash detection. Imagine, if you will, everybody working on two dimensional drawings, plans, sections, elevations, and having to pull this together in reality. When I came into the practice, that didn't happen until the building was going up. So all of a sudden, you'd be out on a job site, and the mechanical engineer would be running duct work, and there'd be a beam, and the two would intersect, and you'd have a collision. And you'd have one contractor worried about their budget, yelling at another contractor, saying, move your steel beam. The steel beam guy saying, what, do you want the building to fall down? So with clash detection, now you take these building information models, and you pull them in together, no matter what kind it is, you can use tools like Navisworks, and it will go through and calculate all of the potential clashes. And then we sit in these meetings weekly and we go through, okay, we've got an issue here, we've got an issue there. All of this was made possible by the technology where different models can be fused together into one model. Because when you had CAD CAM and you had sheet metal contractors with their own proprietary software, putting in their documents and cutting their sheet metal and building their ducts, that software didn't talk with the plumbing software or any of the other softwares, the structural software. So all of those different proprietary softwares are still being used because of the CAD CAM nature. And that all gets pulled into something like a Navis works where we can now see all the different models together and you can see all the clashes appear in red. And I think that what's really interesting is as we look at it from a production perspective, you know, a lot of times these are projects that you're talking about that oftentimes occur over years, you know, like it takes a long, you know, months and years and ours happen very quickly. And so, but one of the things that I thought was really interesting about having you talk about construction is in many ways, it's much more advanced. You know, we kind of show up and, <laughs> you know, we're, well, let's figure this out, you know, like, you know, and figure out who's, you know, somebody's got stuff in my space and I've got to figure out how to move it over and, I mean, the cables are delayed. And I think that in a lot of ways, 
there, there, when I saw the subject, I really thought about in a lot of ways that, that, there, that we are, um, uh, there's a lot for us to learn about logistics. You know, my, one of my favorite, uh, quotes in the world is from, uh, uh is, is, you know, amateurs, uh, talk about, uh, amateurs talk about strategy and, um, professionals talk about logistics. It's general Omar Bradley. <laughs> you know? And so, and, uh, and logistics turn out to be, this incredible um, thing that if you can master those logistics, uh, it becomes something that is that 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 works really smoothly. And I think that we could learn a lot because it's a lot more expensive when you're hitting colli- when you're having collisions, both in time and in space. You know, so so when you have collisions that are, as you said, running into each other, but there's also this team didn't get done on time, so now now you've got an an idle team, you know, or you have a you know that could be for weeks you know, that, that, and, and, and do you let that team go? Uh, I've, you know, I worked with a construction company and that one of the big problems they had, if someone got behind the, the, the demand was so high for the labor, they would just keep them on. They, they had to keep them on staff because if they let them go, they'd go work on another project and then they, and then they're gone, you know, like, and then they, you won't have them when you need them. And so, so there's a, you know, that, that, um, that time and space problem is, is intense. Go ahead, Craig. Can find mute. Um, yeah, you know, one of the things that I find fascinating. So I, I do a lot of large IT projects. What I find fascinating is looking at other verticals, like this construction uh, uh, subject, and seeing how they deal with things. One of the big issues with project management in general is it does a good job of organizing tasks for people and related to that and resource loading. But I find a lot of uh, projects across the board tend not to realize that, oh, this specific task or thing is related to how many of those we're going to need. And so if, if the underlying uh, criteria for that task changes, it's not apparent to a lot of people. And so you get surprised a lot if you don't tie that in. So what, what's fascinating about this is all the BIM stuff and how that actually feeds into the scheduling and project management. Yeah, absolutely. Greg, I found myself at an interesting intersection there, right? I spent the first number of years in my career working on software development, project management, on implementing systems for organizations across different industries. And of course, we talked a couple of weeks ago about the software development life cycle, right? So you've kind of got that that design stage and then the the build stage and the kind of the test, validate, deploy um, stages and then getting into something that was much more um, iterative over time instead of that more waterfall um, project methodology. But construction, of course, has no choice, right? They are always going to proverbially, you know, have to, to you know, um, pour the concrete. And so uh, they, they are, they're stuck in something that's much more waterfall and always, always will be. But where I've definitely drawn, uh, to your point, some some inspiration from construction is how standardized things have gotten, right? In software, you tend to, uh, to the extent that you have questions, be shooting over an email, shooting over a message on Slack or on Teams, um, or or picking up the phone and having a conversation about something that's confusing. In construction, there's a, a concept that Mark could probably speak to as somebody on the architecture side, right? That's basically an RFI. And so that is a, a very formal document that is a request for further information or, or detail from the architect on, on what the intent was from a design perspective. Mark, is there anything more you'd add there? Yeah, so the architect will usually get RFIs from contractors asking, you know, we've looked at the details, we've looked at the plans, and we're having trouble understanding how this is really to be designed. So a formal RFI will be submitted. The architect or one of the engineers will respond to that RFI, and all of that is numbered and labeled. And there's RFIs, there's submittals where the contractor will say, you know, I know you wanted brass hardware, but all we can find is this aluminum hardware. And it, it, I swear it's just as good. And, and here's our submittal for it. And then you have to, you know, be the, the patrol and say, well, okay, if you want to use that aluminum, you need to give the owner back some money. <laughs> Go ahead, John. I know that this is a uh, it depends question. However, statistically, I'd like to know where are most of the lawsuits? Is it with the architecture? Is it with the engineers? Is it with the construction guys? Who's bearing the the burden of most of the lawsuits? It really depends on the form of whether it's design bid build or design build. If it's design build, the if there are legal issues, usually it's worked out in the, as the team. 
because everybody's working together. So you actually probably have less lawsuits in design build. But it would be, in that case, it would mostly be between the owner submitting a claim against the contractor and then the contractor, you know, working its way down the system to whomever may have been responsible for that error and omission. Uh, in, de in design bid build, it's usually between the owner and the design team or the owner and the contractor. It's, I, don't, I would say it's probably more the owner and the contractor, um, but I, I really don't know the actual statistics. So Let's talk about the Millennium Tower scenario that Alex brought up, right? I mean, that's all we talk about in San Francisco. Let's, let's Every reverse. time you talk about an architectural problem, you talk about the Millennium Tower. For those listening, the Millennium Tower is a high rise with lots of uh, lots of places for people to stay that were really, really expensive. And my understanding, and Ryan may be able to correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding was they didn't go all the way down to bedrock. They did a bunch of math that said that they could balance it on top of something that wasn't be bedrock. And so they, they this was new high tech, um, you know, uh, ways of approaching this uh, that were gonna save money um, and uh, and not go all the way down. The problem that they had is a mixture of, um, that they didn't just go to the bedrock, which would have been more expensive and much more difficult, um, but also that they there was a huge dig that happened right across the street um, for the, um, the terminal. So the terminal, uh, there's a bunch of arguments in the lawsuits about whether that affected the Millennium Towers or not, but they, there's an argument that all the digging in the terminal, but it was a mixture of them not getting all the way to the bedrock and the terminal being, um, being worked on at the same time caused it to lean not insignificant amount, <laughs> like, like it's like, uh, and, and so, uh, and obviously there's a lot of upset around it. Go ahead, Ryan. Isn't so, it Millennium Tower? Isn't it Millennium? Yeah. Millennium? I, I don't know. I don't so know. So we'll sure. let the litigators determine, you know, exactly what the, you know, uh, where the liability lands. But just from a from a logistical perspective to answer John's question about, you know, where does the liability fall? The, what what it starts with is a tenant who has, you know, has bought a condominium in Millennium Tower. The higher up you are, the worse this is, who, you know, <laughs> tries you to set a... something on the floor. And, and it rolls. You know, and it's rolling. It's right? like I mean, we go, we're listening. This isn't like it, it's kind of like a problem. It's like if you have a rolling chair upstairs <laughs> at the at the high end, you you got to put it against something because it's gonna. It's not like you're gonna fall over, but it will. You know, it, it's a couple degrees. Right. So so that individual is likely part of you know a condo association, and they uh, need to get it resolved. Right. They need to get this resolved, and so they go out and as an association use their their funds, their treasury to seek estimates as to how how it is that this can be rectified. And all of a sudden, they're given an estimate of one hundred million dollars. And you've got a hundred condos in that building, you know, give or take. And so it's a million dollar assessment per, per condominium. And these owners are thinking, man, I only had one or two million dollars into this unit. I you know need to you know, find out whether there's there's somebody else that can, you know, bear the burden of this extreme unforeseen expense. And so there's a developer, right, that hired a contractor, that hired an architect, that hired engineers, that's going to um, probably end up being served a lawsuit by the, by the condo association. Well, that developer is going to say, well, we, you know, we're, we're involved in the financing and in, in putting this deal together and selling these condominiums, but we weren't the ones that were responsible for understanding whether we need to go down to bedrock, for example, right? And so there's a suit that'll be served to the contractor by that developer. And then the contractor is probably going to sue the specific subcontractor that was involved in making some of those specific decisions. And then what you can sometimes have is the engineer saying, you know what, this was not a problem from a design perspective, but the materials that we procured were faulty. And so now all of a sudden you've got a material supplier in the mix. And that is a scenario where both the BIM models and what you'll hear a term um, used called digital twin, but also a tool like Procore that would be the project management tool set that has the entire kind of chain of events that took place both from a pre-construction perspective, but also the actual construction perspective where you've got daily uh, reports on what did the weather look like, who were all the subcontractors and trades that were on site, and and what did they actually, um, you know, take up in a given day, week, or month? And then, of course, you get photos and these other kind of as-built um, elements, all built in this in this repository that start to get leveraged in litigation scenarios. And and the thing is, is that as, again, what can we learn from that as production? Is that you know everybody? A lot of times we jump into production, and you know a lot of things go wrong, and then everything's fine at the end. And you know the show came out, and everyone goes goes of their you know a lot of things. Little things went wrong, and and it's when thing big things go wrong, 
And when things, suddenly there's this dance <laughs> and the dance is who's going to end up in front of the bus, you know? And so, so the, uh, and, and, and everyone's dancing. And the key is, the key is not to be doing the, the mistake people make is they do that dance, uh, at the end, when something went wrong, then they're trying to find who's going to go under the bus. But the smart dancers have been dancing that dance the whole time. <laughs> like, like they've been they've been slowly, you know, doing all the things that needed to be done to keep their dance was they're like so far behind the bus they can't even see the front of the bus. And there's somebody else that you know it might not have been their fault, but they're a lot closer to the front of the bus because of all, they weren't doing that dance from day one. And um, and so I think that that a lot of times in production, what we can learn from from construction is construction has a lot of that. I mean, that when when it comes to that, there's a lot of like passing that all that data and and calculating all that data so that it's clearer, potentially clearer. There's still a lot of, but it's clearer on who who may be closer to the front of the bus. Um, and a lot of times in our little productions, it's he said, she said, kind of kind of thing, but. But in the same, but I think in a lot of times, we, that's a lesson we can learn is really the documentation of the process and, and how it, you know, is communicated. And, and I think that, again, the, the reason that I was so interested in having you all talk today was because it's such a, um, it's it's just a really large, cumbersome version of what we do. <laughs> like, you know, like it's, it is a giant version of it. And there's so much for us to learn because I think that construction management is way more advanced than per project, you know, than event management, but they're very similar. You know, like we're putting up a lot of things, we're doing a lot of things, we're finding out a lot of things and that, and, and I think that construction is ahead of us because it's, there's more, there's more at stake most of the time, you know, for, for those things. Do you guys have anything else before we jump into the questions? We got some well, questions. it's interesting, Ryan and I were talking yesterday about this and about the similarities between the two and how the construction projects are usually nine months to design a project and a year a year and a half to build the project on a larger project. So uh, it's interesting that you take all the same types of things and you condense them down to maybe a month of preparation for one or two days of events. And it uh, it's just a lot more hectic because it doesn't have that slower little pace to it that's going yeah. on where it's planned out. So what I'd, what I'd build on that with is the concept um, of BIM and 4D and 5D design. So Alex, we've heard you talk about in an event production, the way um, you'll sometimes get renderings of what the completed, you know, space will look like. And you'll sometimes, of course, have a, a project plan for what like that load in or, or, or tear down actually looks like. And when it comes to the further sophistication that exists in construction, um, Mark can speak a little bit to 4D and 5D. So we know what 3D is, right? That's the, the three dimensions of physical space. Um, but Mark, why don't you elaborate on, so, on what I mean, it, It's just are. time and money. So you take the three-dimensional space and then you add to that a schedule and you add to that a budget. And so we'll have models that will schedule out. This is when the construction is going to be and the models will be time-based. So you can see the BIM models grow based on what month it is and then based on what's supposed to be delivered. And that really affects what the budget is because if you have delays for weather if you have delays for materials you still have teams on the site that have to you know you don't want to lose them to another job so you're you're still paying for all of that and a bit of a prediction on my part is that you'll not just see the simulation over time of the materials falling into place but you'll see a simulations and this does exist for some of the biggest projects simulations of how those materials get into place right whether it's a person or a series of pieces of equipment or in the near future autonomous equipment right what's the space they need to traverse and what's the timing they need to actually get a particular piece of this it's construction a, it's a project huge, put in place. it's a huge dance and they'll coordinate all of this ahead of time by choreographing where are we going to put the cranes because the cranes usually go inside the elevators shafts so We've got these big tall cranes. Where are we going to put them? Where are we going to put the materials? Where can we do the picks from? So you have all of this that has to be coordinated and choreographed and, you know, it has to be staged because materials are showing up on certain days. Where do you have the laydown area? Sometimes the laydown area may be miles away and have to be trucked in a short truck haul the day you need it. And the reality is, is that with uh, the same with events that, that you have with construction is that that life experience is really, really important because it's not just like what's on the paper. It is like we were I was doing a walkthrough last week in L.A. and um, and we were looking at it and we were looking at all like between the three or four of us, we could think of all the things that could go wrong with this route and all the things that could go wrong with this route. 
And, but it was all from history. It was all from scar, you know, what we call you know, scar tissue, you know, of like someone cut my line here or someone stepped on this line and that we're going to need this many, you know, this many uh, yellow jackets. And we're going to need this to go over this. And, and it's a much smaller version of it. But I think that that is, um, it does become something that uh, you have to have people who have a lot of experience to kind of start to see that. I know in, in event production, um, when I was on site, I was oftentimes on site three to five times a, a week. Uh, at, at our height, but definitely two or three times a week. And I had this, I talked about it a little bit in the past. I used to have this thing to, when it comes to money is I knew how much it cost me per minute to do anything. Like, you know, we're sitting here, if we sit here for a minute, this is how long it's going to cost. And that could be as little as a couple, couple dollars to as much as, you know, I had some that were as, as high as $300 a minute is what it's costing me to be here, you know, and um, it makes you, it allows you to make decisions really quickly. Like that data, that time, in that money decision, like we would say, I can't find a printer. Well, it's faster to send, send a PA, go back to what we're doing, send a PA and buy a printer, then continue to try to figure out where this one got lost. <laughs> you know, like, like it's just, you know, and, and you make those decisions very, very fast, um, you know, and when you when you have the data um, to do it. And I think that that's, that's what we underlined here. Let's go ahead and jump into the, uh, into the questions. Our first one actually comes from me here in San Diego. With design build, it appears that the role of the architect is somewhat less key in the workflow. How does this affect the art of buildings? Do we swap in more efficiency at the expense of aesthetics? Good, Ryan. So there's a term called value engineering, and this is something I'd love for for Mark to comment on. But you know, there's a, a city in Wisconsin that hired uh, SOM, a really you know renowned architecture firm, to design their new public library, and it had these glass bubbles and it was absolutely beautiful. And then, um, you know, the the picture was on the front page of the newspaper that showed what they were breaking ground to actually go build. And, you know, my goodness, was there a, uh, a stark contrast between what it is that you were kind of initially seeing in the design and what it is that was actually going to be built. And I think just one thing I want to kind of call out there, Bill, is it's not necessarily only due or always due to the the changing approach to you know to this contract structure, but just the nature of um, of the big budgets and the risk and the idea that you are oftentimes um, starting with a certain level of ambition with regard to how much capital can be raised and what kind of returns that will be able to be produced. And then as the funding starts to materialize or not materialize, some tough decisions need to be made. Another thing that Mark um, was kind of bringing up with me yesterday was material escalation. So we all know about the concept of a, a subway uh, system, right? Let's say there's an extension that's going to be built on one of the train lines. And we project that it's going to cost a billion dollars. And then a week, I'm sorry, a, a year or two or five go by between when that was initially planned and when it breaks ground. And all of a sudden, this is a $3 billion project or a $5 billion project. And a big part of that has to do with, you know, inflation and material escalation in general, right? I mean, the, the pricing of some of these different commodities that are inputs to uh, the construction process can can be affected by tariffs or can be affected by supply and demand forces or, or supply chain disruptions like we experienced during uh, 2020. So so these things can completely change the the model. Um, the financial model associated with with building something. And at the end of the day, you can only get something funded by a bank and by equity investors. It's going to be able to produce a greater kind of monthly cash outflow than what you've got for the cost of, of the debt, the original capital up front. If I can follow up a little bit, that makes perfect sense to me. I notice it even at the smallest level of things like fast food places. I, you know, you see them and you can tell what they're trying to do is is – standardize on a building kind of idea. Um, right now, they're taking away a lot of front space for counter ordering because that's becoming electronic. And we have somebody who's tearing down an old jack-in-the-box next to us and building a new one. And I know it's going to be very different. But I also drive through different communities and I suddenly see that they put more time in the exterior of that implementation of that fast food restaurant than they did three communities over. So I know there's a lot of variation in the amount of aesthetic weight they put on building, even a functional building like that. And I'm just wondering if this look at always keeping things, the budgets under control, pushes us toward less aesthetically interesting construction and more cookie cutter construction, for lack of a better term. I think that uh, where you see some of this is in, you know, like where it's really probably applicable to almost every listener is if you live in a in a suburban residential development, you understand that the the bylaws or the HOA will dictate that if you're going to build a new home, 
it needs to have a certain number of materials, you know, on the on the front facade, right? Or it requ- some of these more high end neighborhoods require natural stone. You're not allowed to use, you know, brick or or vinyl siding or fake stone. Um, but yeah, then additionally, I mean, when you move into you know a more urban setting, um, you know, in Chicago we've got aldermen that have input on what it is that a uh, design pertains to. So in some cases, it's a zoning matter that will restrict the amount of height that can be brought in. Uh, to the equation or restrict the types of uses, right? So it, it has to be commercial, it has to be residential, it has to be retail. Um, and I guess further along those lines, you, you've always got community input. So I've participated in and took my wife along because she thought it was interesting, you know, to a uh, to a, a meeting to get approval that was going to take an old grocery store that was going to be torn down on Broadway in the in the Lakeview neighborhood and replace it with what was originally proposed as like an eight-story apartment tower. And of course, what you've got is the neighbors um, who definitely weren't uh, protectionist over the parking lot and the large, you know, grocery store that was was run down there. But now we're worried about, okay, well, if that's eight stories tall, now my apartment that's across the street is going to be completely in the shade at all times of day because of because of the height that's coming on this thing. And naturally, there's a you know the, the yimbies and the nimbies uh, Alex has talked about before, right? You're going to naturally. I mean, I'm in I'm in Marin County, which is the capital of uh, NIMBY. Of NIMBY. <laughs> I think yes. I'm pretty sure it's like the global capital of NIMBY. And NIMBY so, for those listening is not in my backyard. <laughs> you know, yep, so so yep, yeah, that's a beautiful building. You can build it anywhere else. But here, yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. another thing that they worry about is is traffic and parking, right? So these people live in in single family. Um, or, or or small kind of duplex homes where all of a sudden we put an eight-story tower and if they don't put enough parking underneath, is it going to lead to a bunch of cars spilling out onto the street? Or is just the volume of Ubers and taxis that are servicing the new 100 or 400 units in this five-story tower going to make my neighborhood something that went from, you know, much more family-friendly where my kids could play in the street to something where there's, you know, a, a constant degree of traffic? So those are other constraints. And I think that this is just, again, to keep on drawing drawing it back, like, why are we doing this on our show, talking about architectural problems, other than it's just interesting, um, is the is really thinking about it from a project manager's perspective. This is a big version. We have a microcosm of that. You're doing a big event. You know, we were talking about Google is going to be doing, you know, um, uh, Google Next uh, in, in Moscone. And it's so easy for you to forget that, you know, what is the experience of the person from the time they they buy the ticket? Or, or sign up to the time that they sit down at their seat and even the time that they've left. And there's and when you see a hitch, you'll see a hitch in these things, you know, and the hitch is because it's, it's like that collision that we were talking about earlier. One team built something a certain way and didn't think about what the other team was going to need to, for them to get to the next place. So when you get into an uncomfortable hitch in, a, in an event, that was a communication problem between the teams or a lack of understanding what was going to actually happen. A lot of times people don't think about that. That's, I mean, the, the most, the best example is the fire festival, right? No, a bunch of people who've never done an event <laughs> said, I, I think I can do this in three months, you know, and, and anybody, all of us who saw that when it was announced, we were like, wow, that's going to be horrible. Like there, there was no, no question in people who do events, how that was going to turn out, you know, and, um, you know, and so, uh, so I think that that is, um, this again, when we, when we when you think about these, all these big problems, these are just humans are humans, and these are things that just keep on squeezing down, and they look identical except they're smaller um, when it comes to doing actual event production. And Alex, I mean, when you're talking about live events, you're always fighting some of the same challenges with regard to noise and light and traffic and volumes I mean, of humans and restrooms and everything. If you're else going that- outside or inside, absolutely, you know, you do have to pay attention to, um, you know, there's, you know, how many restrooms do you have and. And specifically, how many women's restrooms versus men's restrooms? Because it's just it's a it's a slower turn, so you have to figure that out. And then and then you have to figure out, um, you know, you know exactly how many people are going to come in at one time. And that really, uh, person flow is so important in large events. And people just don't like they, you know, anybody who's not worked in an event just thinks they can open the door at at, at ten fifty five for an eleven o'clock show. And everyone's going to be seated and you're like, uh, you know, like doors have to open at a certain time. And they're like, well, we need a little more time to get something. Well, we need a little time to put people, put, you know, these, these, um, human beings into their seats in a way that doesn't have them feel rushed or sweaty or anything or upset and not have them stand in very long lines if we can avoid it. So there's all of these things about, you know, how do we, how do we manage all of that? And it comes down to also just simple communication. I mean, you're talking about like how you communicate with communities. 
we had a problem. This is when I was in my early 20s. And we had a problem where we had an event where there's a small, it was a business park in Denver. Um, and uh, and there's a business park and they had a little place in there on Fridays. They're not allowed to use anything other than the parking lot right around them. But there's 200 people and they've organized up all those areas that they're allowed to park people. And they're not in anybody else's parking. They're just along the road inside the business park and, the, and they've organized it with the business park and everything else. Cars would go everywhere. <laughs> you know, like people are going everywhere. They're, they're, it's just chaos. And I came in and I said, just treat them all like planes. And I just, you know, so I just said, well, let's treat them all like planes. And so what we did is we put people so that it was never a time when you couldn't see someone that you're gonna, that's gonna give you the next direction. And everyone goes like this, just big arms going this way, telling you what you're doing. It's not like this, or it's not like, it's not this half. It's just big, big movement. And in one event, we had it all worked out. <laughs> you know, like, and it was, everything just, everybody just, it's not that they did, it's not that they were being difficult. They just didn't know what to do next. And, and they had never seen this before. And they were, you know, so, so anyway, those are the kind of things to your point. You have to think about how do you make it easy for people to move, move through that. Let's go to the next question. Peter Buck in San Francisco. Speaking of pro, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, speaking of pro Procore and Autodesk, how do you look at the differences between those products? Big revenue difference with Procore at eight hundred and fifty million dollars, Autodesk at one point five billion, five point one billion dollars. Go ahead, Ryan. So Autodesk has been around for a long, long time. They started back with with AutoCAD and with with two dimensional. Um, you know, plans for buildings and have moved into the, the third dimension, fourth dimension, fifth dimension with um, with BIM and then with the new Autodesk Construction Cloud and uh, Autodesk Build. And so that takes from something that's just working at the design stage and now moving into the course of construction, right? That's what we call that that phase where the building is actually being built. And so this is kind of a much more kind of traditional uh, database and traditional project management system where we've got a, a list of tasks. Who are they assigned to? What's the date we anticipate they're going to start? Um, how much budget do we have allocated in terms of of hours and days of schedule dedicated? And then how did that actually play out? And those tools, when you're talking about Procore and Autodesk, are integrated to the back office financial system, right? A lot of our small businesses, we think about QuickBooks and the bigger, in, uh, you know, in the construction industry, Sage is a big player for financial systems. Um, uh, Viewpoint is a big player, CMIC, uh, Microsoft. And so these big financial systems have job cost ledgers that have uh, cost codes and cost types and over a schedule. And, and, and these systems actually push in the specifics. So that's a little bit about what Procore and Autodesk do. Now, I mentioned um, the difference between, um, you know, these two products based on size. Procore is actually a company that's been around since 2002. It's a 21-year-old company, but just went public in approximately 2017. Um, you know, it is it is much more singularly focused on the course of construction. It has an ability to pull in the design and the BIM um, models, but those were probably developed in the Autodesk suite, right? So, so you could say Autodesk is much more uh, vertically integrated through the construction process from pre-construction all the way through the course of construction, where Procore is a little more focused just on the course. And then remember too, Autodesk serves more industries than just construction. Autodesk serves manufacturing and, and, and many other industries as well. So there's a much wider surface area Autodesk covers. Now, when you think at um, of their, their revenue growth, though, I mean, Procore is growing at an enormous clip. Uh, they're, they're growing something like, you know, 50% year over year when it comes to revenue. So when their quarterly revenue numbers come out at 200 million for the last quarter, leading them to 850, I mean, it, it, it's it's a it's a quite a, a rapid pace. So so you might see these uh, level out and even out here in in uh, short order. Good, Mark. Ryan pretty much covered it. Uh, Autodesk has been in the industry since the late '80s with two develop two D development of uh, drawings and such, and then moving into the BIM world. And they focus on multiple industries now. So they have tools that all different industries are using. Procore is pretty much focused on the construction side of things with the contractors and handling the things and the workflow that they have to deal with. And and Mark, you're, uh, you're having some gain issues with your mic there. So uh, we'll, we'll maybe have you look at that a little bit. Next question. Douglas Carmichael's up next, and Douglas says some audio product manufacturers like L Acoustics offer downloadable Revit files for their products. How are they used? I think it's Revit. Uh, go ahead, uh, Ryan. So when you think about um, the two-dimensional and three-dimensional models that we're building, right? You can start with one kind of piece of tooling that's, okay, let me draw a line. Okay, let me extrude that vertically to create a wall. 
Well, when we start to think about, um, you know, whether we're talking about mechanical systems, um, think about not just being able to kind of like conceptualize a pipe by saying this needs to go in this direction and I'm going to extrude it and it's going to be this diameter, but instead being able to pick from a manufacturer's vetted specific pre-built models that are already driving the constraints around the different lengths that the sections are um, manufactured in. And it brings in the constraints around, let's say, the size of a, of a truck or the, a trailer that this piece is going to actually come in on. And so that's at the at the systems level. But when you're thinking about the fit and finish of a space, of course, um, you know, what actual pieces of furniture or what actual wall panelings exist out there on the market. If we can use pre-existing materials, we set ourselves up for significant cost savings when compared with needing everything to be completely, you know, custom built to a particular spec that we invented with our with our BIM tooling. I know Mark will have more on that. Yeah, go ahead, Mark. So it, it, exactly what Ryan said is that it all comes down to how much time the architect has to invest into the project and designing every little, you know, tool. So think, think of a bathroom. Think of the amount of fixtures there are in a bathroom. And if you had to custom design each one, it would take you forever. So the manufacturers are in the position of saying, maybe they'll use our products if we give them the BIM models. And this works not only in plumbing fixtures, but it also works in furniture. It works uh, throughout the entire industry where you have final fixtures that are going into place of the building. Yeah, I, I know that for, for event production, we have some companies that, are, that, that will provide 3D models of those things, and we use way more of them simply because I can throw those into a SketchUp model. And, you know, it's a much smaller version of what, what's being, SketchUp is a very, very small version of what we're talking about here. But when we're doing layouts and stuff like that, if I have a pre-built system and there, there's some, I, I just feel like companies that don't do this really put them on, themselves on the outside. This is for events, for construction, for everything. You put them on the outside because it's so easy to grab things and start to figure out where they go. And, you, and when it starts with, especially like acoustics. So, oh, we'll put some speakers here. Oh, we have these speakers. And so we just put those speakers in. We're not planning to use them. We're just putting speakers where we need them. But then the, the, those are the speakers. Well, let's just go ahead and buy those. <laughs> you know, and so it's it's a really, really smart thing to do. And it's a huge mistake by a lot of companies not to put, build 3D models of, of their products. And most almost every product has a CAD drawing. Like, it, this is not... This is not like someone has to go and model something from scratch. They have the CAD drawings and putting those out as basic things so people can think about them is really important. I, one of the things that I've taken from construction, because I have a lot of friends that are in construction and I got better at, at, uh, at doing things like LIDAR is I LIDAR everything. <laughs> like I just walk in and I go and, and, you know, little things I might do with my phone, but I have a BLK 360, which is kind of a low end LIDAR system that can get nominal data that I can work with. And we build... 3D models of almost any place we're, we think we're going to come back to. And sometimes even if we're only going to do it once, you know, it, it, get an excuse to, to use it, we'll use it. Uh, next question. Josh Kaufman in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. B, uh, BIM apps that negotiate physical collisions in construction world is a brilliant application of the software. What techniques can other industries, for example, media production, use to highlight these types of conflicts between departments and crew? Go ahead, Mark. I think just the the way different seeing different things have to work around a site, whether that site is a construction site or a stage. So just think about how you might have camera cranes working. Are they going to interfere with each other? Think about shadows and lights. Are spotlights going to hit something that's obstructing it and create a shadow you don't want? So there's that, there's just tons of things that if you can put the BIM model of a stage or a set into this and then run these tools on them, it would tremendously help. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, I would think that there'd be more of this. I actually don't see that much. I would love to talk to Tlaloc at some point about uh, theatrical lighting in terms of the the throw reach of specific fixtures. If you've got a stage and you've got Lico 750 uh, Lico's up here or the equivalent in this instrument, to model how that's going to interact with other lights. I know just last week I had a big softbox uh, as my key light on a shoot, and I looked down and I thought, I, well, I have this also little LED light. Can I use that for fill? I had to actually set up everything and determine whether or not that small light was strong enough to add short side fill in my circumstance because I didn't have enough metrics about that. would have been great to be able to model that and bring in my light on one side and my fill on the other, see if it worked. 
Yeah. And you don't, you want to try to experiment as little as possible, um, as you know, on set as possible, you know, cause a lot of times we have very limited amount of time to do what we're doing. It might be a couple hours, might be a day, might be a few days to load in. And so the more we can get into coordinating what those are, and that's really going through oftentimes really hard meetings. I think a lot of folks in media production, you know, avoid those meetings, those grinding like two hour meetings of, okay, this truck is showing up here, this truck, you know, to, you know, it's a very small version of what we're talking about in construction, but can often be, you know, like, what is the, what is the dock schedule? Like, you know, there's a dock coordinator that's going to manage that. What is the, what, a, what is your wireless, who's the wireless coordinator, or do you have a wireless coordinator? Um, who's going to manage, you know, and it's, it all gets down to like, when are we doing meal breaks? And when are we doing, and, and a lot of times, you know, for these really large events, we have to think about all of those things weeks in advance because you can't request it and it's much easier to argue about it three weeks before the event before everything's sitting there than it is to do it on site and i think that this is where again the this big lift that you see in construction can teach us a lot in you know of, of being willing to deal with all those little details in advance um next question Craig McFarlane in Boston, Massachusetts. How does a pr build project coordinate and or collaborate with each subcontractor's project? Good, Ryan. I think that's the main promise of a tool like Procore. And I, I didn't mention that in a prior conversation, right? But the general contractor tends to be the one that owns the Procore Autodesk build uh, license and instance. And they actually, in Procore's case, are paying as a percentage of the annual construction volume. So if you've got a $100 million project that's being delivered over the course of two years, that's $50 million in construction volume. And Procore charges a percentage of that uh, that project budget to uh, provide the software. And so uh, the, you know, the overall project plan is, is loaded in there and the sub specific subcontractors are invited. And then they have access to subsets of the project that state when they need to be where and what what's expected of them. And then they're actually logging in and, and there's no kind of um, specific pricing per user, right? The idea is invite as many users of, as you want uh, add as many documents and as much data as you can, and then facilitate the coordination and the collaboration in terms of those um, RFIs and the submittals, and then facilitate the punch list items and facilitate different things like daily daily reports and safety checks and all of these things bring down the risk on a project, right? I mean, when we talk about all the different risks, safety is the most important risk that there is to be managed. One thing you'll hear when you're in the halls of a construction company's headquarters, you'll see them do various rituals that really emphasize the importance of safety and the way that culture starts all the way at the top. So in the beginning of a meeting that we'll have, where we'll be talking about CRM software, we'll do a safety talk. We'll talk about a near miss and it'll be about something that happened in the car ride, you know, over to the office and how that, how that applies. But the idea is, you know, the most important thing is getting every single person home to their families, you know, to have dinner on a particular day above above all other priorities. And these platforms allowing for us to kind of run through a checklist on a particular day and then thinking into the future where we've got computer vision that's watching out for, are we missing the two points in our harness that we need if we're, if we're up in the air um, or were all the people clear from a particular path of a piece of equipment? These are all things that these, these tool sets, um, you know, help with in terms of the GC who's really just uh, managing the relationship with the owner and managing the budget and the the subcontractors who are the ones that are actually supplying the equipment and the people out there in the field to get the thing um, done. You know, that that's how these softwares help all of that process work together. Good, Mark. So one of the advantages of working on design build, design build projects is the fact that the design build projects, people are working together, utilizing all these tools that were just mentioned, but also we're coming together in meetings. And, you know, 10 or 12 years ago, we'd be flying all over the country to go to these meetings on a weekly basis to sit down with all of the subcontractors and all the different trades, all the different designers, and put these buildings together before we've even bid on them because the contractor needs to know what to buy. So we have to design to 30% in order for them to get a price together. Nowadays, well, about 10 years ago, we started doing all of this over tools like Zoom, or teams, whatever was available at the time. And everybody would go in a conference room and sit there and work on it. Today, we're all sitting like we're sitting here. Everybody's got plans called up on the thing and, and we're just going trade by trade for the entire day through that entire building. Go, John. You kind of you answered my question there. How did you guys ever do any work before computers, Mark? Oh, what? Hey, I grew up making 
what they called blue lines, which was feeding the blue line machine. You guys might call them blueprints, but we called them blue lines because it was white background. And there was so much paper, so much paper, so many filing cabinets, so many flat files where you had to pull the drawings out every day and work on them. It was, yeah, it, it's, I, and I think that part of like the kind of buildings we can build now are different because of the, all the computer modeling. You know, you just, you just couldn't do, I mean, the Romans could do it, but they had a lot of unlimited uh, supply of people. So We had um, FedEx come once a day and pick up 30, 40 tubes of drawings. That's crazy. <laughs> Next question. Peter Buck in San Francisco. Justin Hansen in the PM channel on Discord asked about products for equipment check-in and check-out. John Snyder and others responded with some SharePoint and WorkOS options. Any additional recommendations? Go ahead, Mark. So there's a product called Sitemetric. It's a company, actually. And what they do is they put RFIDs on different components that are used in building buildings. And it's usually baked into the contracts that the owner will require all the subcontractors to have these either as tag IDs or as RFIDs on their helmets so that for safety reasons and other reasons, financial reasons, they can keep track of everybody that comes on and off that job site so they know how many people from each trade were there each day. Go ahead, Peter. Nothing certainly as elegant as uh, Mark's response, but uh, it's more of a plug for Discord. We've got a good community building there on the project management activities, and John's response uh, for some nice add-ins to SharePoint were there. Also, my favorite product, Airtable, from the Zakinator, an interesting product. But the point is, uh, put your questions there, and we'll try to follow up uh, week by week on new tools. We'll add... Uh, uh, the idea that uh, Mark just put in to the chat. Next question. Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas. We've talked about Neom in Arabia. What kind of project management issues would it present? Go ahead, Peter. Well, for those that have looked at that uh, project, it's quite fascinating. It's, you know, the goal is by 2030 to have a community that is self-sustaining, doesn't rely on uh, fossil fuels, has drones, high-speed trains, all renewable energy-based. Uh, but when I hear that storyline, I can't help but think of the Tom Hanks movie, uh, The Hologram for the King. If you haven't seen that, it's a funny uh, 2016 comedy where all Tom Hanks wants to do is sell a teleconferencing system to the uh, Saudi king. So my concern would be what could go wrong with drones and high-speed trains occupying the same space? I'm, I'm I'm pretty excited about watching what happens. I mean, I think that uh, I think I, I watched the documentary, and I really felt felt like the architects were like, "Well, we don't know if this is going to work, but it'd be really fun to work on." And um, you know, that's that that's the that's the uh, the subtle the subtle cue that I saw when they talked about it. Like, we don't know, and um, you know how this is going to work, but I will say that uh, we are going to learn a lot, you know, from it. And I think that even if they built a mile of this, the amount that we'll extract about construction, urban development everything else will move the whole world forward. Like I, I really, you know, it, it took me a little while because I was really negative about it earlier until I, and then I had to watch the, the, I was more negative about it after I saw the, um, the documentary. And then I, and then I, uh, and then I thought, wow, if they actually do just a mile, like what we'll learn in, in this, and if they do 10 miles, not a hundred, but just 10, it'll change everything about how we look at this, you know? And so I think that it's really an exciting project to keep tracking. So we'll, We'll keep tracking it because it doesn't matter whether they get to 100 miles or 150 miles. It matters that they do part of it. You know, if they if they actually break ground, it's going to change how we look at everything. It's really exciting. Now, next question. Peter Buck in San Francisco. With better collaboration in the, in the design-build partnership changes, is there any data to show improved outcomes? Mark? So I'm sure the Design-Build Institute of America can show and point to data that might you know, back that up. But I can tell from experience that just because the fact that everybody's working together on the same team, that it really helps the project move along much faster. And I'd say that usually it cuts a month off the budget, time budget. I guess the question here is that is, there is a, um, you know, how much do you do where you, you there's, there's a comfort in doing things that are with the same people you always do them with. So there's this second hand, if they're internal teams or if they're part regular partners. And then there's the, the, the ingenuity that comes with new people that, you know, they come from a different, a bunch of experiences. What I found was that 
is that we, you know, we, from a production perspective, we were constantly thrown in with different broadcast partners, different uh, event partners, and it was very rarely the same people. Like we did have a clique of people we liked to work with, but we did, didn't get to choose. And so we were just constantly being added to, you know, this is the live streaming crew. This is the thing. This is what they're going to do. And, and what was inter at first, it was really frustrating. I was like, if we just did one, one project with, or if we just worked with the same teams for three or four projects, this would get really smooth. But at the same time, we learned so much every single time because we there'd be weird things that every team did that we really liked, you know, like they'd mark things a certain way or they'd run something a certain way or they'd use these certain tools. And we found that we evolved very fast because of that. Do you, do you think that there is a certain danger in falling into a rut? You know, um, if you if you work with the same folks that might not grow out of what 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 you're used to doing. It's an, that's an interesting observation because I look at it from a different point of view. Because we are always having to bid on work in order to win, we try to put together the same team over and over again because we've done these types of projects so many times that we've already gone through a lot of, you know, room for improvement lists, the other RFI. And so we, we can then show a portfolio. We've done 10 right. of this type of building. So we know what we're going to run into. Now, there are certain specialty contractors that you want to get for different parts of the country just because the dirt's different. So you may want a geotechnical engineer that really understands the West Coast versus the East Coast. You may want a structural engineer right. for the same reason because structural engineers practice differently on both coasts. So yeah. there are some nuances to it. And it's to your point, you know, when we do productions in other countries, a lot of times we want to hire a certain percentage of our staff locally. Even if we have enough people and we have enough budget to come down, we'll hire the minimum we'll hire a fixer. And that fixer is someone who just knows all the product and they know where all the rental houses are. They know all the, they know what all the rules are. They know all the other things there. But oftentimes I want to, or I want to hire my audio engineer from there. I want to hire my video, uh, one video camera operator because they have on the ground, like understand where things are. They have friends, they have gear, they have <laughs> lots of other things that kind of glue everything together if it didn't work. Anyway, really, really great hour. Um, so uh, Craig, Peter, Ryan, and uh, Mark, thank you so much for your time. I know it's not just the time here, but for everyone, they've been really working on this and thinking about this, and we're really excited about this program. So we'll be doing this once a month. Next one is, I think, October 2nd and then November 6th. Um, so about once a month, uh, we're going to be having these conversations and really uh, answering your questions about project management. It won't all be construction, although that would be a really good, you know, second hour, maybe a lab. Keep on talking about construction. I have a friend, Fred, that we talk about construction all the time. So um, anyway, uh, so thank you guys uh, for for all being here. Um, and thanks to the rest of the panelists for such a, a you know great first hour and uh, and second hour. Uh, thanks to the producers that kept the questions going, kept us going through the first hour and the second hour. You, we can't do this without anybody here, and we definitely can't do it if we run out of questions. So thank you so much for your contribution there. And thanks to the incredible team that is managing this, figuring out what we're going to do each day. A lot of the folks that you saw here talking are actually in the council, um, so that are thinking about these things. And so, um, so thank you to the councils, um, to the management team, to the to the developers, to the, the production team that actually has this actually happen. Uh, we really appreciate everybody's uh, contribution to it. It's a, It really is something that we all come together and put together as a team. Uh, we traveled 71,000 miles, that's 115,000 kilometers, and that is 566 million bananas for scale. All right, let's go ahead and jump into after hours. Got my listener up. Might be listening. You never know. Very cool episode. Thank you all for yeah, that was great. coming in. Yeah. Yeah. Great job, guys. I want to make a compressed BIM called Dim BIM. <laughs> <laughs> it's one that doesn't have everything it needs. It's a Dim BIM. It's like, oh, it's kind of a Dim BIM. Collisions optional. If you've got collisions, does that become a BIM BAM? Yes. <laughs> and if the project fails, it becomes a bim bam boom. Oh, bim bam flim flam. Ah. No, that's if they charge you too much.